Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we are super excited for our first day of Manufacturing Week with our sponsors, the City of Concord, who helped us put together a wonderful lineup this week. I'm really excited. Today's our first speaker. I'm gonna let um, our uh, person from the City of Concord introduce our speaker for today. Um, a little housekeeping. I understand it's a little different today. Uh, you all can see us. It's hard for us to see you because of the nature of um, the virtual world these days and in person. So um, we just really appreciate that you all are here. Uh, teachers, if you can put any of the questions that you have in the chat box and I will uh, moderate those and read those off to our guests during our Q&A session at the end. I am recording and photos will go up on our social media pages after this. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Robert Carrera from the City of Concord. Thank you, Erin, and good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's presentation as part of a week-long celebration of the Brazil's Resiliency and Strength of Bay Area Manufacturing, Bay Area Manufacturing Week. Manufacturing is part of the bedrock of the Bay Area economy, economy employing over 300,000 people in the region and supporting all of the other industries that make the Bay Area the vibrant and diverse region that it is from technology to agriculture to art. Manufacturing Week started on Manufa National Manufacturing Day, which was on October 1st, and it runs through October 8th. And it's organized by the Bay Area Urban Manufacturing Initiative, which is a project of SF Made that brings together 32 cities and counties from all parts of the Bay Area to support manufacturers and collaborate on issues close to manufacturing. Uh, City of Concord has partnered with the school district and local manufacturers to uh, give students an inside look at our local manufacturers and learn more about their unique manufacturing processes and the value that they bring to the economy. And here joining us today, I'm very pleased to introduce Norgren, who's also known as I am my citizen and specifically Blake himself to teach us more about their company and what they do. So without further ado, uh, Blake, please take it away. Good morning. Thanks, Robert and Aaron. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Blake Musoff and as Robert mentioned, um, I'm with IMI Norgren. Uh, we're at a site in Concord, which is previously known as Macro Associates. Um, and uh, just appreciate the opportunity to uh, share a little bit about what we do and uh, my, my path to get here. Um, and hopefully it's encouraging to all of you. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Um, born in uh, the Midwest. Uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and spent a, quite a bit of time uh, in the, uh, we were kind of in a rural area, so spent a lot of it, a lot of time uh, tinkering on things, uh, which is probably what led me to engineering. Um, had a, a grandfather in Wisconsin that was uh, actually a wood carver and a blacksmith uh, and worked on the railroad and loved spending time with him um, during uh, summer uh, my, my path to engineering is a little bit unique. Um, in some cases, I uh, was interested in, as I said, you know, mechanics and, and those type of ventures uh, early on. But then um, as, as I got into high school, I actually uh, took, uh, went to Ignatia Valley High School, so locally, and uh, took classes in mechanical drawing and architectural drawing. So um, wasn't sure at that point, you know, which path I was going to take, but um, spent my high school years um, being interested in both of those and, and potentially pursuing those. Uh, but right after high school, I got an opportunity to uh, start working at a local uh, manufacturing company uh, called Micropump that was in uh, the Bay Area for up and through the mid 90s. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, I went to night school at DVC. Um, from that, uh, at that small company, we designed pumps, gear pumps for medical, the space industry, and other um, critical, um, were sold into critical equipment. Um, hey, Blake. Hey, Blake, I don't mean to cut you off, but your paper, whatever you're holding is picking up the sound behind you. Okay, sorry so, about that. <laughs> yeah, it keeps cutting you off. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. I don't want to miss uh, too much here. So, yeah. you know, it's um, kind of quiet here. Uh, my current job, um, just to give you um, a little background on that. So uh, my title is Principal Engineer. Uh, my experience allows me at this point to uh, be involved in product design, manufacturing, engineering, quality, uh, production, planning, sales, uh, just about um, every aspect of the company. So there's uh, opportunities. I just want to convey that when you get into a manufacturing company, there are um, chances that you will be able to touch uh, many of the functions in the company, so you get to understand how all the all the things work. Um, IMI uh, employs over 10,000 people worldwide, and the facility in Concord, as was mentioned, is part of a division called Norgren. And so we've got uh, those 10,000 people in over 50 countries supporting markets like life science, uh, industrial automation, and commercial vehicles. Uh, I'm gonna show a uh, quick video of the facility now and uh, be able to explain some of the, the things we do here in Concord. Sorry, this is taking a second to get going here. No worries, no worries. Welcome teachers who just joined. Please put any questions in the chat box that students may have, and I will be sure to read them off at the end. Let me know if you can see that screen. Yes, we can. Okay, so this was done for our new CEO, um, but it's a very good um, short video on our facility. You seeing this? Okay, great. Coming into the lobby, um, there's our IMI Precision logo. This is our uh, tool shop. So we've got some, some equipment uh, for doing small modifications. Uh, this is production equipment, actually uh, data acquisition, taking uh, measurements off of our pinch valves, which is our primary product. And that's what you're seeing here is um, Trays, typically trays of 25 to 30 pinch valves are produced at a time. There's one of our valves clicking away. Uh, this is a larger pneumatic product uh, that's used in bioprocessing. Um, and it's uh, typically they'll use stainless steel as one of their primary materials. Uh, this is a part of our manufacturing area. And to the left there is our clean room. Here we're doing some smaller uh, electronics and uh, this is tubing assembly on a dialysis pump inside of our clean room here, doing some uh, motor assembly, final assembly and test on the pumps. And these are some of our quality folks uh, checking up on uh, following standards and procedures. A little um, carousel for inspecting the pumps. Winding room, we wind our own solenoid coils here. It's magnet wire. And we do a lot of cabling and harnessing for our electric valves.
All right, so hopefully uh, you guys got a little taste of the facility in Concord. And um, thought I would uh, describe a couple things about um, typical day for me. Um, we use uh, Microsoft Teams for calendars and meetings. And so on any given day, I could have three to five different meetings scheduled. So there's a lot of uh, team-based meetings. We do what's called stand-up meetings. So those are typically like 15 minutes. The team gets together uh, kind of uh, plans for the day and we highlight any concerns at that point about shipping product to a customer. If there's any gonna be any uh, delays. Uh, we talk about um, personnel, budgets, those type of things. Um, also at, at management meetings. And then I was gonna talk a little bit, um, just highlight a few tools that um, are used in my um, design efforts. And um, I do have a couple of images I'll show you in a few minutes um, to kind of uh, give you a visual of those. Um, we use different softwares um, now for, uh, you know, creating the product designs uh, like mechanical design and some uh, wiring. Uh, we also use um, LabVIEW for uh, cycle testing. And then we use um, different types of uh, combination of calculations, stack ups, um, stress analysis and dimensional controls for uh, defining the products. Um, I was going to show, uh, typically, I'm going to, throughout my day, um, we're taking notes all the time. So typical um, engineering journal, you guys probably do a lot of journaling. So all the engineers get issued uh, journals when they start and uh, you typically fill them up about every four months or so, three to four months, uh, we fill an entire journal with all of our engineering notes. Thought I would uh, show a couple of products that uh, are recent developments for us and uh, start with some smaller ones. So um, this product is a, uh, for a company in Utah. Um, their requirements were to do a, uh, they're working actually on a baby ventilator. So this isn't a COVID ventilator, it's for a baby, an infant that has uh, probably, uh, or most often a, a preemie. Uh, that has underdeveloped lungs. And so this, this is a solenoid, it's an electric valve. Um, there is a piece of tubing that runs through, um, I've got tubing samples here, but there's a piece of tubing that runs through this slot and our valves are opening and closing the tubing to let flow through. And in this case, uh, with the ventilator application, we're letting little bursts of air through. And my design challenge on this one was to create a valve that's quieter with, than what they're currently using and to open and close uh, approximately 11 times per second. So 11 Hertz, little tiny bursts of air and it helps uh, the infant develop their lungs. Uh, recently, uh, within the last year or so, we developed a line of electric, what we call proportional valves. So this valve has uh, not only mechanics, but it's got an electric stepper motor. So it has very precision uh, linear travel and also involved designing a controller and software that, that went with this to be able to uh, load different programs for different uh, tube pinching applications. Um, this guy here is actually the biggest uh, <laughs> model of our uh, proportional valves. Um, using a head of, from another product and attached to a very uh, high force, uh, what they call linear actuator or linear stepper uh, with a uh, guide system in front to keep uh, the axis, parts on axis. Uh, tubing, just give me an idea of tubing so we can go from small this type of tubing for the smaller valves. Uh, we can actually go smaller than this. This is quarter by eighth, eighth being the ID. 
and we could go up to tubing this size. So this is approximately an inch and a half uh, ID, inch and a quarter ID, and inch and five eighths OD. So from really tiny uh, flow paths to large ones. And so we're de designing all of our pinching products around commercially available uh, tubing. Um, two other uh, products I wanted to show you just um, kind of as comparison about the size range of things that we do. So this was designed, this is using that same head that I just showed you on the motor driven valve. This is a pneumatic valve. So this has got an air cylinder in it. And these are the ports, um, air ports, open and closed ports. Um, this is capable of over 100 pounds of linear force. And this is where the tubing is installed. installed. So there's a lot of safety features um, I designed into this. The sliding sleeve, um, this is a hinged cover, and this is how you load that flexible tubing in there. So basically it gets loaded into the top, and then um, hopefully you guys can see this. <laughs> um, it then comes through the side like this. So in comparison, this was done, uh, finished back in 2012. I'm now working on a tiny little uh, solenoid product. Uh, it'll be one of the lowest cost products that we've ever designed. Uh, it's for a uh, analytical system in, uh, out of Ireland. We're currently working with a company in Ireland. And this one, I will show you um, how we, let's see, let's get the camera here, how we load the tubing into this pinch valve. So in this diagnostic system, um, this is going to be um, pumping some of the reagents through their flow path. So that's some products um, just for a reference of what we do in Conquer, design and uh, build and test those. Um, I thought I would uh, show you a few slides. Hey, Blake, can we ask a couple of questions specifically to those um, pieces you just held up before we move forward? Sure, yes. Um, so somebody asked, what is the largest unit used for? And what about designing for tube failure after a set amount of pinches? I don't know what that means. <laughs> so I'll pass that on to you. <laughs> I know exactly what that means. Okay, so the largest unit which would be, you know, let's say this guy. Um, we currently are specced in with a unit very similar to this. It actually has the stainless steel head that you would have seen in that video. Um, and then the high flow tubing. So what's happening is, if you're familiar with any companies that, that are in either what's called pharma or bioprocessing, this could be a company like uh, Pfizer or Moderna or Genentech, those type of companies. What they have done is their cell development, some of them just develop cells, some of them develop therapies out of those cells. So all of that's happening. And these guys, when they get their cell cultures, it's basically the bioreactor, they call it, which is growing the cells, has um, somewhere between, let's say a week and four to six weeks of time that they spend developing the cells. When they're done with that, they wanna move that fluid quickly because it's very expensive and you've got live cells and you need to get it from the reactor to let's say cold storage, um, just like vaccine we heard about, you know, transporting the, vac the COVID vaccines, um, temperature is critical on time. So these larger flow tubes accommodate the um, higher flows. So they could have reactors that are from anywhere from, let's say, five liters to 5,000 liters. And when they want to move that fluid, they need a big valve like one of these to be able to move that fluid quickly. Uh, the second question about the pinching. So uh, it's interesting. This tube, this large tube happens to be, it's kind of a hybrid. And I don't think you'll be able to see necessarily see the little, maybe you can along the sides. This is a braided silicone. So it's like, a, it's like the best of both worlds. Silicone, which in that small piece, uh, this is a non-braided silicone, um, very inert 
to temperature changes or even, you know, it's widely used. You've heard of silicone gloves and silicone other things. So it's a very widely accepted medical material. But to be able to hand, handle higher pressures, they've taken a silicone and put a braid in it, like a polyester braid, so it will not explode when you put higher pressures in it. But the pinching action over time does wear the tubing out. We typically recommend somewhere in the thousands of pinches. Um, we can go up to hundreds and even millions of pinches. But since the tubing is kind of a, a disposable item in most systems, because they want to keep everything sterile, that um, we don't recommend necessarily doing like trying to get the longest life out of your tubing. Uh, we would recommend that you are safe and you probably change it out more often. But if the question, I'm kind of forgetting what the quest, exact question was, but if it's around life of number of pinches, uh, is that correct? It says, what about designing for tube failure after a set amount of pinches? Okay. So typically what you're gonna do, <clears throat> we don't want to have the tube ever fail. So we're gonna put a safety factor on that failure. Let's say the tube ruptures typically will wear out because the pinching action needs to seal pressure. So we're going to uh, be exerting force to be able to seal that tube every time reliably. So that, that force we're exerting on the tube is gonna wear, cause some wear. The, the plastic or the rubber eventually will start to um, crush down a little bit. And so let's say the tubing typically in this application will last 100,000 cycles. We may tell the customer you should change it every 50,000. So that's how we design. Um, so there is never a tube failure. That would be in some of these cases either very expensive or hazardous. Um, if they're moving, sometimes it's not vaccine, they're actually moving uh, biohazards through the valve. And so you would not want to have a tubing ever rupture. Very cool. One last question before we move forward. Are all parts created at your main office? Are you 3D printing parts or ordering parts from, from other companies? Good question. So we are 3D printing. They're typically, uh, or currently, I should say, not going into a finished product. Our 3D prints are for test and evaluation, form and fit, uh, you know, that type of thing, and a lot of tooling in-house. So we're starting to make a lot of our tooling fixtures, assembly aids from the 3D printer. But the industry has not really accepted the 3D printed plastic uh, type of materials that we have here. I know we're, we're going to get there someday. Um, and then as far as the other parts that we have made, uh, we used to be a machine shop in Concord. Uh, we sold that business to focus on engineering and uh, get into these more technical industries and uh, like electronics and software. So we buy our parts from either local shops in the Concord. We have a vendor in Concord. We have vendors in Northern California. We have a, a vendor in Mexico and we get some parts from China. So all over the world, um, we are currently not making uh, any of the parts here, but we do specify them and we have our all, they have to pass our quality control when they come in. Thank you very much. All right, should I move on to my slides? Okay, let me know when you can see my screen. We see it. Okay, so you'll notice the August 11th date on here. Uh, I just left that on. This was uh, through, uh, not COVID related, it was a previous relationship, uh, but I was asked to uh, put on a webinar for Moderna back in August. So we had already been selling them pinch valves from Concord 
uh, back in 2017 is when we first got a relationship with Moderna. So this was a way for us to show them uh, beyond even the valves that we make in Concord. We also showed them syringe pumps from our Las Vegas division and then what's called um, layered uh, manifolds from our Farmington, Connecticut division. And I'm not gonna show much about them. I'm actually gonna go through these slides pretty quick uh, considering time but just thought it would be interesting uh, to show you kind of what we uh, what we have as far as products here. Um, like I said, we did valves, pumps, manifolds, and we did accessories. Uh, got an overview here of the company. I'm going to show you um, the slides will come up. There we go. Uh, this is probably a little hard to see, but um, this is, uh, if you consider Norgren IMI, um, what we sell into bioprocessing only and medical is all of these products. This one here, top right of the red um, puzzle piece, these are the acro products. So we're, as they are showing here, we're just one piece of this Norgren puzzle. Uh, but this is the Concord products here. Uh, these are the syringe pumps from Las Vegas. Uh, these are some of the manifolds down here from Farmington. And then we actually have another company in the uh, division in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that does these. Um, they're more like gas manifolds and diaphragm valves and stuff. This is the Concord product line. Um, and we've been with IMI Norgren since 2018. Uh, originally established in 1976 when it was a small private company. And we have the clean room, as I mentioned. We're also ISO 13485, which is a medical device certification. We're one of the only divisions inside of IMI that's actually ISO 13485, which it's in essence, it's a quality system, high quality system. This is just kind of an um, image to show you a little bit about the pinch valve. This is a dual slot valve. So we can do open and close. It's uh, sometimes called a toggle valve. And um, this is typical. We're just showing a section of the panel. But these valves used in a medical device are typically you have your electronics or your air uh, system behind the panel, safe and away from the user. And then your tubing that gets changed out uh, would be installed in front of the panel. Uh, this is our top of the line solenoid valves, and there's a lot of features in here. We have seals. There's a seal inside and on the panel. Uh, so we refer to these as medical valves, um, and we do lead the industry in size range for medical valve. And then these are our three lines. Uh, the medical valve, I just mentioned, solenoid. Uh, we have a full line of pneumatics. That was that large black valve I showed you. And then a full line of these proportional motor-driven valves as well. Uh, this is our one of our proportional electrics showing a couple of different applications here. Um, I think I'll just show maybe a couple more images here. Um, we do a lot of custom uh, products here that turn into standards. It's very common in industry. Uh, when we first started doing, doing like, let's say, stainless steel valves then that can turn into a stainless steel product line. Uh, in the video, you saw some of our uh, solenoids in production, and then these are all harnessed. Um, so we do a lot of cable and harnessing, It's kind of a value add. These are some other custom options, safety caps, lockout features. This is a long manifold we did for a, custom, uh, a customer that could not get this anywhere else. So we designed this hinge manifold so they could have 10 of our solenoid valves and a uh, tubing set that would be easily uh, installed and removed. Next couple images here I'm gonna show are just um, some other things I thought would be of interest um, from my job standpoint and also what the company does. So this next one is 
um, trade show displays. One of my, probably my most enjoyable part of the job is if I get to either design and build a trade show display or go to a show and be able to um, talk to customers. It's always around our products. Um, how do our products work? Well, there's no better way to convey that than showing it in a display. Um, we're, we're fluid control people, so we've always got some kind of fluids in here. You can see the colors. Um, this display, um, these are both our proportional valves, and we decided to do one. This one's the electric one. We've got the blue fluid running through, and this, uh, this pneumatic had the red fluid. Um, and then this one on the right here, um, I'm showing the design team. So there was actually more people than there. There was probably six or eight of us that were involved in designing this beast of a thing that took us hours to build at the trade show, but we got a lot of interest. Uh, we were able to, uh, a customer could come up and set a fluid level. So this is like a mixing tank right here. They could set the level of this tank and the temperature of the tank. And we had a thermal reactive fluid that um, when the fluid reached a certain temperature, this tank color would change. And so the customer was sort of interactive. It had our pinch valves, it had pumps down here. We've got a cold tank and a hot tank. So we've got all sorts of uh, electronics and these two boards, the center area is uh, two uh, large, we call the M boards which is driving the entire system. So fully uh, automated and uh, just a joy to, to be a part of the design team on that. Some design tools, uh, which I mentioned earlier, these are just some visuals of that. So um, for mechanical design, mechanical electrical design, um, FEA, finite element analysis, you can use that for stress, you can use it for flow, um, a lot of different functions that will be critical to your design. We'll do simulations of, and so this is an FEA, I'm looking at forces inside of this cap, and you load it up with uh, you know, like a maximum force on certain surfaces, and then the output of the tool tells you uh, where the weaknesses, the flaws in your design are. So you don't have to go make parts, do empirical testing and find out that it fails. You're going to get through, we usually do, you know, several iterations in, in the software first, and then we will go make parts and, and validate that. To the right here is two different images of uh, simulation tools that um, I worked with our team in Farmington, Connecticut. Um, they have solid, um, sorry, um, solenoid uh, simulation software. And so I'm gonna enlarge this image here because it's really hard for you to see. Um, well, I've got PowerPoint open. I hope that's visually okay. So what this is, is it's several different um, solenoids. You can see this length here is longer than this one. We're looking at what the magnetics are doing inside of the solenoid at certain power ratings and uh, distances between these two, what are called the pole pieces. And then this uh, data here is the output of, of the simulations seen in graphical form so we can actually evaluate that. So those are some, uh, some typical tools we would use um, during the design process. I know most engineers, um, you know, are wanting to look at data and analysis type things. So, so this is some nice tools to have. Um, this la last image here is um, a patent. So this is one of several patents um, I've been part of at the Concord uh, facility. So um, kind of putting Concord on the map because the uh, city of, um, Actually, I'm a resident of Concord as well. So um, <clears throat> they have your name and <clears throat> your city of residence here. And then you have, um, you know, there's an entire process that if anybody's interested in hearing about it, how you file for a patent, how you go through the, the patent uh, evaluation and patent searches and stuff. And then 
to finally get the patent, of course, is, is a big uh, win for the company uh, because then we have some ownership and uh, control over our designs in the future. Okay, so that, that was all for those. Okay, so how much time do we have left? Five minutes or so? So, yeah, if we can, yeah, I mean, it's 9.37, we wanna end, we need to end by 10. Um, we wanna make sure we give at least 10 minutes for Q&A. So, yeah, you have about, you have about 10, 10 or 12 minutes. All right, <clears throat> I have two more slides that are just about kind of what we look for, career paths and what we look for. So in a new hire. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, so I thought it would just be good to summarize. Um, and there's obviously, this is not a complete list. It's just uh, some, some potential directions to go in your future as you're thinking about college and careers. Um, as I mentioned before, in high school, I took architecture and mechanical drawing, which led me to a mechanical engineering uh, path. Uh, but you have all sorts of um, options. I even wrote down a couple other that, that, that are not on this slide. So I put down tradesman, craftsman, uh, mechanical engineer. You can get into electronics, robotics, architectural, and then a a construction contractor. So anything, if you like to work with your hands, you like solving those kinds of material and um, assembly problems, so to speak, how do things go together? How do they fit? How do they wear? Like the question about the tubing failure. Um, engineer's job is to figure out when things will fail so you can make sure they don't uh, in a, in the wrong at the wrong time or in the wrong situation. Um, I've also thought of a few other areas that um, just as I've been, um, we've been redeveloping our team here in Concord, an engineering team, you know, people move on and people you hire and have to uh, train new talent. So during our rebuild of our engineering team, um, what I came across is several other uh, potential careers, which would be, there's what's called a drafter uh, designer, technician, you could be a dock control person, uh, software developer. I mean, so many of those things are all touching engineering from one, even technical sales. Um, they all touch engineering and need some engineering background, but maybe you're better working directly with people than you are working on computer simulations. So maybe technical sales is is a good career also. So just wanted to note that. And then some of the markets, uh, medical equipment, the sciences, manufacturing, contract design. Uh, for a while, I just did, I worked at home and did contracts for people. And then architectural design and building all um, seem to be, you know, using similar skill sets. And then my last slide, so what do we look for when we, uh, like I mentioned, we just hired some new engineers. We're looking for uh, an attitude, certain attitude and typically friendly. Um, if you're gonna be on an engineering team, um, you need to be a, you know, play well with others and be uh, friendly. Um, a self starter, you know, don't wait till somebody asks you if, if your project's late. <laughs> Um, if it's already late. So, um, you know, get started early. I'm sure you guys deal with that with homework and stuff. Uh, being accountable. So if you're going to be late, you know, tell somebody way before it's due so you can get help. And then asking for help as well. That seems to be a, a problem with engineers that don't ask for help. So we encourage that strongly. I mentioned team player already. Um, 
for, for mechanical design, this next one is mostly understanding and having an interest in three-dimensional concepts. Um, some of the other sciences also deal in three dimensions, uh, but mechanical engineering for sure, um, you know, that's going to lead to, you know, your modeling, 3D printing, et cetera. And then uh, for an engineer, we are looking for typically for a bachelor's degree, um, or if you want to start as an engineering tech, um, a two-year degree or a high school diploma will get you in the door um, with mechanical aptitude. Um, we just had an engineering tech who was uh, promoted to an associate engineer. So you can, you can take an engineer path uh, several different ways. I thought I'd just highlight that. That's awesome, Blake. Right, Thank that's, you. That's pretty much all the plan material I had for today. That works. We have a couple good questions here that I'd like to ask you. Um, where did it go? Oh no, I saw something about slide three. Jay, can you retype that question about, you said slide three, I can't find it. But one of them says, tell us about your recent hires as far as where they went to college and what degrees they had. You kind of just answered that, but aside from that one person who just um, got promoted. Okay, so for the, um... Yeah, for the engineers, <clears throat> so we have a um, manufacturing engineer that, and I'm trying to recall, I mean, I've looked at a lot of resumes. I'm thinking he went to uh, UC Davis and um, had a couple years experience before he came to us. Um, we have another engineer that just came on. It's a quality engineer, uh, a gal, that went through, IMI has what they call a grad program. And what they do is they take young students right out of college and put them through, usually it has to do with four different locations um, around the country. And so this gal, uh, Jessica, just went through uh, four, as they call them, rotations. She she did six months at four different sites, which meant she had to move four times, uh, but she did it. And she ended up, her last stay was in Concord, and she wanted to stay here. So we hired her on, and she went to Colorado School of Mines and got her mechanical engineering degree. Um, we also currently have um, a person that's working with me on a special uh, marketing design, marketing focus project, but he's on as a design engineer. And he's part of that grad program also out of Mexico City. And uh, he's working remotely, which has, of course, made things a little more difficult. But um, he graduated uh, with a mechanical and electrical degree out of uh, Mexico. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so one of the teachers asked back on slide three, when you enlarge the two items, there is a third image similar to Autodesk programs that students use. What programs are you using for the iso isometric images of products? And do your engineers have experience in Autodesk products? Okay, so if I, in general, um, I don't have slide three, but I can, if it's just isometric images of products, um, it's probably, uh, we did renderings, we call them, which would be like, you can get up to photorealistic looking images of a solid model, right? You can get all your materials looking correct. And a lot of the stuff you see in, you know, video games or movies are solid models that have had all sorts of renderings done to them. So we do the same thing for our images and we currently use SolidWorks and then some of the add-on packages. So our renderings are done from SolidWorks through a render program. Um, we also do most of our mechanical design in SolidWorks. 
Um, I do have familiarity with Autodesk products as well. Um, spent many years, um, don't want to date myself too much, but I spent many years doing AutoCAD. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Before, even before solid uh, modeling came out. Uh, but then I used Inventor for a while. So I used Autodesk and Inventor. Um, our division in Farming Connecticut uh, is solely, um, well, their primary, I should say, uh, software is Inventor for mechanical design. But most of the other divisions are using solid. Awesome, thank you. Um, does IMI take volunteers or interns of potential high school engineering pathway students at any time? I mean, I know it's COVID, so it's a little weird, but typically? <laughs> Prior to um, IMI, Norgren, uh, buying this site, and we were part of another company at that time. Um, so pre-2019, 2018, um, we were doing several interns every year, and we hired a number of those people on. So it was a very successful path for us. Um, my son actually went through uh, like an intern, summer internship here in Concord as well. So very successful. Um, since IMI bought our, you know, the company we were, we were acquired by that we haven't done that but th as much, but it doesn't mean we won't. Um, our engineering manager um, and I talked uh, prior to, um, you know, late summer or during the summer, I should say, about bringing in um, like high school interns. And he said he would definitely be open to presenting it as, as a resource, you know, can we bring in a couple of engineering uh, interns like to help us in the lab? That would be a typical thing to run tests in our lab to, to do re, you know, research or, or um, you know, help in quality or whatever. Um, so I think it's, it's open. If there's interest, certainly uh, let me know. And we can... Um, we can see if we can set that program back up. It's just um, when the when the IMI bought the uh, Bimba Corporation, which we were part of in eighteen, um, that just got put kind of on the back burner. Totally understand, and we will definitely let you know. <laughs> um, how have things changed since COVID? Have you? and your team and your company, the company been, you know, responsible and needed to create equipment for COVID units or ventilators. And I know you mentioned the piece for the infant ventilator earlier. Um, you said it is not for COVID vents, but have you been needed in that realm? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the bigger IMI, actually a division over in um, Switzerland, called FAS. They, uh, I believe it's fluid automation systems, but they do all sorts of stuff. They were involved. Their production, I think, went from producing, I'm just going to kind of throw a number out here, but producing like 5,000 of these small um, control valves a month to like 30,000. I think they grew by five or six times during COVID to support ventilator production. So that was one success. Um, as far as the local, um, well, I should say other divisions had some increase in business also, whether it was manifolds or, you know, fittings that we do, other stuff that might have gone into ventilators, um, kind of accessory parts. But then Concord, we saw increase in our pinch valve business where we would get orders that would say COVID on them, um, COVID application or something to that effect where they're trying to get the parts expedited. So we definitely saw an uptick and we're still, there are people now that um, whether they're on the development side of the vaccine, like some, you know, could be the uh, the booster shot development or whatever, or they're actually making vaccine 
Um, we've seen some new equipment manufacturers come on board, some new players, and they're using our valves also. Um, as far as locally, um, this team prompted through management, the bigger IMI corporation, from March of last year, I believe, um, maybe February of uh, 2020, uh, we started taking every employee's temperature every day. Um, masks were mandatory, except for what, two months ago or beginning of the summer when we could take them off for like a week. <laughs> and then they went back on. Um, masks are mandatory. Um, we have an internal tracing system uh, because we have some of our production folks that sit near each other. Um, we've tried to put um, plexiglass barriers uh, between the workstations and in our uh, lunchroom. So nobody's sitting more than, you know, closer than six feet. Uh, if somebody comes down with COVID, we've had a few. Um, far as I know, it's only been ever isolated to them. They're quarantined, they're off for weeks at home, and we've never traced one to another person in our facility. So we've, we've I think we've got a pretty good control system. We were doing cleaning three times a day where we would wipe down every door handle light switch and button on like the, the community copier or water cooler um, three times a day. <laughs> we would all uh, trade off and do all the cleanings. Um, that, has, that has been able to be um, dialed back, but we could certainly kick it off again if we needed to. Very good, so many changes for all of us. So I have one last question, unless anything comes in through the chat, but um, is there any advice that you can give the high school students that are listening now that are potentially interested in the engine, you know, in the engine in engineering pathway? Um, is there any, you know, advice you could give them? Is there any maybe software that they can, you know, get better at before they move forward with schooling and education? What, what is a piece of information that you would give them so that they can be well prepared when they graduate from high school and go to the next thing? Well, for that's a, a good one. For mechanical engineering students, if you can do um, solid modeling as part of your either high school, you know, class choices or um, get a hold of a student version of the of the software because there's pretty decent discounts. Um, and it's, of course, it's part of the software company saying, I want these students to come out and know my software. So then they go to their company and, you know, the company will buy it. But at the same time, you have an opportunity, a low cost opportunity to learn that software. So whether it's SolidWorks, Inventor, um, LabVIEW is a great piece of software. Now, you're not going to just go buy that, but that's an automation software for anybody who's kind of on the fence with, I'd like to do programming. It's a visual programming language for running equipment. We run our, um, you guys saw in the video, those automated valve, solenoid valve testers. It's running on LabVIEW. LabVIEW, you plug the valve in, you turn, you hit go. LabVIEW runs the program. Um, you can take all sorts of inputs and create outputs. You can generate data reports. Um, Math Lab is another one. Um, but then in general, encourage, encouraging the students to maybe um, look at all the different career opportunities um, out there, you know, mechanical, electrical, software, chemical, you know, aero, Nautics, you know, there's so many engineering options and maybe try to get the uh, read up on, you know, the benefits and advantages and maybe disadvantages of each one. Um, I can put a plug in for the medical, medical device industry because, sorry, I've got an intercom going on in the background. <laughs> Um, I could put in a plug for the medical device industry only because this company I'm at now and my previous company, my pump company, we both had some ties to medical. And I'll tell you what, the stability of the market 
withstands a lot of downturns where other things like maybe transportation or, you know, we've seen it with other industries during COVID, how, you know, like cruise ships or restaurants or, you know, other things are dramatically affected. Um, some engineering fields are affected also. So I'd say do your homework on kind of honing in on what field you're most interested in. Awesome, Blake. Well, thank you so very much. Um, it's very cool that you talked about the 3D printing. I know that Concord High and um, uh, Mr. Hopkins class specifically does have a 3D printer. They've shown me some of their, their things that they've created over the years, which is very cool. And uh, Mr. Trowbridge works on, you know, all that kind of stuff with his students too. So we're very excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Robert, I'll pass it back to you to end things. But uh, Blake, again, it's great to see you again this year. And um, it's a good start for, for Manufacturing Week this year. So thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, at Blake, that was a fantastic presentation. So again, on behalf of City of Concord and the um, Mount Diablo Unified School District, thank you so much for being here. Uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, this is the first of the series of presentations that we'll be having Thursday, or I'm sorry, on Wednesday. Wednesday morning, we'll be having a presentation by Raven Dell Woodworks, and then. Um, the, and then Thursday of this week, we'll be having a presentation done by uh, Calitho, both of them local manufacturers, and we'll give, they'll be giving their insights on their unique manufacturing processes. But with that, again, Blake, thank you very much for being here. And to all the students there, I hope you, I hope this is a very resourceful and sizable presentation, and I wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.